Today, I'd like to take this opportunity to clarify a few things about what I teach. Uh, I have been a little disturbed in the past when sometimes people question me about my style and insist that I have a, a certain style of doing Tai Chi that is uh, different from others or something. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I do not have a style in the I am not, I'm trying to teach the classical Yang style in the most classical way possible. And I feel like the classical nature of my teaching has been borne out by especially the visits of my, some of my Russian students to China. They have a little bit more access to it than most people. Uh, they, they can go to Beijing, they can go to all kinds of places. And uh, some of them, one in particular, has a particular job such that he has access to uh, some of the finest teachers, and more or less anyone he wants to meet in China. And invariably, these Chinese teachers remark on the completely classical nature of what they see in my students. In fact, they are always a little bit uh, almost disturbed by the fact that their teacher is not Chinese. Uh, so I take this as a certain validation, uh, at least of the fact that what I am teaching, as I say, is not my style in the sense that I have not reformed Taiji in some way. But I do feel like the nature in which it is taught uh, in most of this country in particular is a little bit too much, almost in the nature of a religion in that you just are given certain practices, you are told to repeat these practices and do these practices, and then at a certain point you will manifest some sort of skill. But even the sort of skill you're going to manifest is not really made very clear. Uh, the only hint of it is that uh, you might be able to like shove people around you know, like these like toy show shoving matches, which I do not feel are very productive of good Taiji Chuan. Uh, I feel that the Twaisho exercise in particular has been extremely, I don't know, corrupted into an end in itself when actually it is simply one of the points of the curriculum of the Yang style. Now, what I feel that I have is a curriculum, and I am devoted to teaching that full curriculum of the Yang style. I think it's very complete, and I think it's the fact that parts of it are left out by teachers uh, as if they didn't matter is a matter of ignorance on their part. And uh, furthermore, I think that uh, my teaching of the Siang style is based on its relationship to certain fundamentals that are vital to the actual learning of Tai Chi Chuan. And I've taken things to specify what I think these fundamentals are. And there are eight fundamentals and I promise I did not try to make this come out the number eight to just see if you do that. But I found eight fundamentals that I think are extremely critical to the learning of Tai Chi Chuan. And I found that it's much easier to teach the elements of the curriculum by relating those elements to the students back to these fundamentals. So I'd like to take the opportunity today to name these fundamentals and sort of give a short explanation of why I think they're important. And they have a certain order to them. Uh, as I say, it's not, the, it's not the order of a curriculum. Uh, you don't learn one and then learn, but to a certain extent, they are linked together this way. Uh, so the first one, the most basic one, is posture. And posture, that word covers a lot of things. I don't mean the word posture if it's used in the 13 postures or the 8 trigram postures. Right now I'm using posture in the, you know, the most simple, ordinary way that people mean it. How you, know, how you hold your body and what you do. But I will amplify this to say that posture, in terms of what I mean by it, has an element of movement to it. And it's rules not only of just how you stand or sit, but it's rules of how you behave to a certain extent. <clears throat> uh, the most critical element of this posture is the plucked up back. And I say the most critical because it's the most central to the body. And it does something which uh, is of critical importance in terms of everything else you do. It unifies the torso into one unit, into one piece. 
the advantages of this are many, but one of them is that once it's unified into one piece, it, then you can designate a center of that, which is nominally the center of mass, but it doesn't have to be. It's just a point that you pick and you say, okay, now I'm going to uh, make all of the movements of my now unified tor uh, torso revolve around this point. In Rat and Ratter, I've come up with three exercises that I call the Daruma exercises, which simply triangulate this point in terms of uh, axes. There's an axis here, there's an axis here, and there's an axis upper and lower. And where those three axes intersect, that is the point. And this is the Dantian. The Dantian is not some uh, structure, physical. Uh, you can't find anything and say, there, there, that's where it must be. It's simply this point at which the body moves around. So uh, it's possible to locate it in the wrong place. And in fact, uh, all of this pretty, pretty much consensus about where it is, and my teaching agrees with that consensus. It's approximately an inch and a half or so below the navel. But again, it is, it is fixed in place by these axes. It must be right in between the hips. It's got to be you know, transverse this way and so forth. But that's done by the exercises. Um, and uh, you can describe a lot of errors that people make in their movements by saying their center has popped up. You could consider it could, might have gone anywhere, but usually what it does is pop up. And by that, I mean this point at which they move the body around has ra risen to someplace like this so that now it moves around this point. And it's very easy to do this accidentally for a number of reasons. So it's extremely important to consider this an element of posture. Uh, as I say, the first requirement of that element of posture is the plucked up back. The plucked up back does all kinds of other things too. It makes it, for one thing, extremely easy to give you other elements of posture. For instance, if I say, can you open your arms to the maximum amount in a certain position? Uh, well, obviously I could open them, you know, much more than this, but to do this would violate, would feel like it breaks this plucked up back, it destroys other elements of posture. Uh, another element of posture is the attitude of the shoulders. Uh, this is simple to really restrict in a certain way and by saying, I will never do, any, I'll never ask you to do anything that makes the shoulders anything but as broad and as flat as possible. There's a movement of the shoulder where it's presented in this way, but this does not violate either one of those things. It doesn't become any less flat, it doesn't become any less broad. However, if you pinch the shoulders backwards, raise them up like this or something, these are just basic violations of posture and pretty much nothing I ask you to do will uh, create that error. <clears throat> There's other elements, I don't want to go into the whole you know, litany of everything you learn when you learn posture, but these are the kinds of things. Some of them are a little more complex than this. Uh, things about how you control the knees and so forth. All those things are elements of posture. So by, by specifying these elements of posture, then it becomes possible to look at what I would consider the next fundamental of the study, which is Chansa Jing. I consider Chan Tzu Jing, or Chan Tzu Jing is usually called the silk reeling exercises. Uh, uh, they're sometimes related to that. Uh, Chan Tzu Jing is, I think, the most neglected element in the Yang style. And I think one of the reasons for this is the popularity of the exercise has given, has made a lot of people anxious to simplify it. And I'm sorry, but I, maybe a lot of people will just turn off at this, but I really don't think that Tai Chi Chuan is something that can or should be simplified. By its nature, it is quite complex and it's quite difficult. It involves a com very complex retraining of the body. It is not natural in the sense that if you just kind of decide, oh, I'm going to be natural today, then everything you do will be just wonderful and in conformity with Tai Chi Chuan. It is natural, the term natural is used in a slightly other way, and I'll, I could get into that in another lecture. Why is Tai Chi Chuan called a natural exercise? But just take my words for it. It doesn't mean it's easy. Natural does not mean easy or simple. 
And it's, as I say, by its nature, it's fairly complex, and it has that history. It has that reputation. So for somebody to say, I'm going to teach you something that has the reputation of being the most complex, difficult, hard to learn thing that boxing has ever produced, he said, I'm going to simplify so that it's really easy. Uh, I don't see why anyone isn't kind of suspicious of this. So uh, chance of gene uh, is a vital element. Now, you can learn pretty much all the elements of posture that I mentioned before doing the solo form. In other words, you can learn the solo form in an external way. And that really can cover a lot of the elements of posture that I just mentioned. They can all still be there and they can, you can practice them while you're doing the form. Uh, and then you, if you add this uh, chance of jing, this is adding the internal concept. Whenever you hear uh, the Chinese talk about internal force or internal movement or anything like that. They're talking about chance of gene. They're not talking about something mysterious in the inside of your body or something that you get through some deep meditation or something like that. This is, this is a learnable physical thing. And I will try to do uh, a little uh, demonstration at some other time, which you can see where I'll show you some of the simpler forms of chance of gene. But, um, it is something that if you didn't have these rules of posture in the first place, if you just practice these winding movements of the body, they would tend to make you kind of strange. Uh, and sometimes uh, you can see when certain uh, things about Chinese boxing, especially Tai Chi Chuan, are character, caricatured. They're caricatured in this way by people being just kind of this like sneaky, uh, this is frequently the subject of Japanese movies when they show the Chinese villain. The Chinese villain is always, you know, doing all kinds of wiggly, funny things while uh, the Japanese are very, you know, straightforward and, you know, kind of virtuous, sort of. Uh, so, in other words, this is something, and they're right in a certain way, that if Chance and Jane is applied without some sort of fundamental structure to pour it into, it's going to uh, result in some bad things. So that's why I put it as the second fundamental. It's, you know, you need to get this structural thing first, and then you can add the chance of jing. The chance of jing has uh, frequently been discussed as, you know, sometimes people excuse their leaving it out by just saying, oh yeah, that's for power, you know, that's, that's for like, you know, if you want to fight, if you want to kill people, if you're like, but our Tai Chi Chuan is, you know, modern, it's more non-violent and everything. So we don't need this element of chance. We don't, no, I'm sorry. The element of chance of Jing is extremely critical to many more things about Tai Chi Chuan than just how much power you have. And as again, the curriculum is designed to show you that. And so when you go through the curriculum, you will see how if you do not have chance of Jing, there are many elements of the curriculum that become uh, completely obscure, if not impossible. So, uh, chance of Jing is a vital thing, a fundamental. The next fundamental I have on my list is what I call uh, differentiation of substantial and insubstantial. I mean, I don't just call it that. That's a very famous, kind of well-known aspect of Tai Chi Chuan. And practically, you read something about it on every other page. It says you must correctly differentiate substantial and insubstantial. Differentiate. So, how do you differentiate substantial and insubstantial? Uh, one real aid to this is chance of gene. Chance, differentiation of substantial and insubstantial is as simple as, well, the idea is sometimes expressed as empty and full, or, uh, or heavy and light. None of these things actually accurately convey what is completely meant by substantial and insubstantial, but they give you the idea so that they can feel like, oh, you know, if, if one part of your body is very, you know, empty and another part is very full and this part is substantial and this part is insubstantial, uh, moreover, if you touch someone and they push you, then if you yield to this and that's insubstantial and if you like push them back, that's substantial. Uh, in other words, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. But uh, this is really not, not a sufficient way to completely uh, instigate substantial and insubstantial change in the body. Whereas Chan Su Jing is very helpful for this. Because Chan Su Jing, simply these winding movements, we all do winding movements all the time. But when you learn Chan Su Jing, 
you learn to sequence them, to serialize them, so that they travel through the body in a wave of change. Instead of just everything winding all at the same time, some things happen first, and some things happen second, and some things happen last. And this is why Titus I has a certain kind of elegance to it, and it is also critical to the way you take steps, and the way the legs perform in a certain concept of empty steps, which you will get into some other time. But, uh, but the point is, chance aging is a great help in creating uh, a feeling of substantial and substantial if you define the substantial as the initial movement and then successive movements as changing from insubstantial to substantial as they create further movements. Uh, Peter Rawson once put it in a very good way, he said, fundamentally Tai Chi is getting out of your own way. Uh, I like that. But when you get out of your own way, something has to initiate this. And it can't be completely passive. Now, if somebody touches you and you move, and then another part moves, and another part moves, that's one description of it. But you also want to be able to get out of your own way while <laughs> in the sense of how you move. And uh, not initiated by, you know, someone else, but how you move the whole body through space and how you walk around and so forth. So this change of substantial and insubstantial is defined and practiced through the mechanism of chance of gene. You, just to make it, I'll just try, approach it a little bit. In other words, I might have something start in the leg, move from the leg to the body, and then from there to the extremities. And the way this is expressed in the classics, it says uh, internal, internal force, and when it says internal force, again, it means chance of jing, is rooted in the feet, directed, uh, transmitted by the legs, directed by the waist, manifested in the fingers. And that sort of gives the whole way that it moves through the body. In another, in another uh, classic, it says, it movement moves through the body like a breath. Uh, so the whole body doesn't move all at once, but it moves in waves. And this is what gives Ch Tiger Chuan its reputation of having this kind of um, relaxed and elegant and graceful movement. If I got, I've told students in the past, if, if it embarrasses you to be a little elegant in your movement, then don't study Tai Chi Chuan, because that'll just prevent you from doing it right. Because you don't have to be phony to be elegant. It can be a natural product of what you're actually doing. Now, of course, it can be very easily made phony. And this is one of the problems with uh, Tai Chi Chuan, is if people just start making very elegant movements with their hands, then they can give the impression that they're doing something very sophisticated. But that movement must come from waves of change that go through the entire body. This is the, the, the fundamental of the differentiation of substantial and insubstantial. Now, the next fundamental on my list is, to me, the, the most important one of all, because it's the one, it's the subject of Taiji Tuan's very name. It's, uh, it's making Taijis. How you make Taijis with the opponent, and to a certain extent, the taijis that you make with your own body and so forth. This is very critical to Tai Chi And I wrote a whole book devoted to this called The Theoretical Basis of Tai Chi Chuan. But in the book, I was quick to point out, simply understanding this theoretical basis does not immediately make you understand Tai Chi Chuan, uh, because it is the theoretical source of how all the movements work. But it isn't the physical source of how they work. To do that, you need many more fundamentals than that. And these are the fundamentals you have to add. But certainly, it is very critical. Now, what is the fundamental necessity when you make Taijis? When you make Taijis, you must be able to differentiate substantial and insubstantial. The whole question of somebody touches you and you yield here and you return the force somewhere else, this is insubstantial and substantial, and then it changes and becomes and reverses. And all of these changes of substantial and insubstantial are kind of dependent upon you understanding those waves of change and how they go through the body, which I say, Chan Su Jing is extremely useful in doing this. I, 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 and it's possible to do it without Chan Su Jing, but I just feel like the mechanisms involved, sort of gravity or other things, uh, or momentum, all of these are questionable in terms of how they fit into the really advanced levels of Tai Chi Chuan. 
So uh, this is a fundamental, and as I say, it's probably the deepest and most important fundamental of all, because that's what Tai Chi is called, Tai Chi Chuan. It's like <laughs> boxing based on the Tai Chi principle. So if you do not know the Tai Chi principle, and if you cannot manifest the Tai Chi principle, both in your own body and especially in relations with an opponent or a partner when you practice. And one of the things you'll notice about me when I teach it, I really confuse these two terms on purpose, opponent and partner, because everything in Tai Chi, in the Tai Chi curriculum is, it's kind of too difficult to do in a competitive way. Uh, what you're doing is learning very deep fundamentals, and these fundamentals are hard enough to learn when two people cooperate in doing them. But when you, you discover that once the fundamentals are learned, then they can be used in a competitive way against an opponent, against somebody who jumps you on the street or something. I mean, I think Tai Chi Chuan is a great and wonderful martial art. It needs to make no apologies like this. But uh, it, this doesn't mean that it has to pretend that every exercise that it does is an opportunity to be competitive. I'm afraid Tai Chi Chuan, as I say, is too difficult for this. You really need work with another person. So, as I say, your, your partner and your opponent are sort of the same thing. You treat them as an opponent, but you treat your opponent as a partner. And that, that persists until the highest levels of Tai Chi Chuan practice. Now, <clears throat> the next thing that happens after you learn how to make Tai Chi's is you learn martial techniques. And this is the fifth fundamental on my list. And this is called the Eight Trigram Postures. And that's so fundamental and important that that is the other thing in the whole symbol of Taiji Chuan, which is the Taiji symbol surrounded by the eight trigrams, and those represent martial changes. Now, if anyone tells you that you can learn Taiji Chuan without it being a martial art, I don't know what they're teaching you, but it, but it, it's I, I wouldn't call it Taiji Chuan. A Taiji Chuan is is I mean I've heard people name it different things, you know Taiji this or that, fill in the blank. But don't worry, it's not a martial art. That's not what I teach. I teach a martial art. And the most traditional, I feel, is my teaching is the most traditional of this martial art. So it's very essential that you learn these um, eight trigram postures. And that, again, is almost kind of symbolic of what they are. There's many different martial techniques, but they've been put into eight categories uh, in terms of learning the. Tai Chi Chuan, and those are called the eight trigram postures. And sometimes the eight, the eight categories are a little obscure. Like this one called split. And split can mean you take the opponent's force and then split it into two pieces, into two parts. And it can also mean you break his arm into two pieces. So, you know, a split, like I say, it has a kind of, you know, a lot of meanings that you can adopt to it. Uh, but it pretty much explains most, uh, if not all, of the techniques that show up in traditional Chinese boxing. So, this is a very, very fundamental, and the first exercise you learn in this is, in the Tuishu exercise, you learn what's called Pangu Jian, which is the, uh, which is the change of four martial techniques, and you see how the Tai Chi Chuan principle persists through the change of those four techniques. And then this proceeds on to Dalu, which adds four other techniques, because they're eight trigram postures and so forth. And this is really a phase of Taiji, like all the other preceding phases, that you keep on studying for the rest of the year of your life with Taiji Chuan. You know, you keep getting the better with the form, you keep being able to, you know, differentiate substantial and insubstantial better, you know, you keep having better chance of Jing, everything gets better, and if you don't just learn it and then put it aside and stop and go on, all of these fundamentals persist through all of your practice. Uh, but the first three are the only ones that you can practice by yourself. As soon as you get to making Taijis, which is actually called, uh, in the nomenclature of Taiji Chuan, it's called adherence. That is the meaning of the word adherence, is making Taijis with the opponent. Uh, so uh, this will go on and on and on, but you're given those, you know, things to start with. And as I say, there's no ascension, there's no idea that you complete this thing and then you go to the next thing. Everything is ongoing. But the next thing you learn after you learn these types of principles of uh, change, this is using the Taiji uh, uh, postures or martial techniques 
to inform the changes of the body. And by the changes of the body, they mean like the whole body, especially this unified torso that we have created. So again, if you don't have good posture, this is going to be completely obscure. But if you do, these changes, according to making tidies with the opponent, create changes of the body, and those create steps. So uh, Taiji has a very unusual method of teaching footwork. Most places where you want to learn footwork, they teach you all kinds of steps. Do this step, do that step, do this, do that. And Taiji says, no, no, no. You can't take any steps intelligently until they follow the changes of your body as dictated by your relationship with the opponent. So it says, well, luckily and amazingly, you can learn these changes and you can learn all eight of the Tai Chi's that you need to learn without moving your feet. So it's a very logical process, really. It says, let's have a fixed step practice in which we, we develop all the changes of the body. Maybe if they say, they'll keep developing. But we get them developed enough and so enough so that they are informative of your movement enough to make you take steps. So the next element of the fundamentals is the taking of steps, which is usually called the five element postures. And the five element postures are forward, backward, right, left, and center. And what it really means is, uh, this, by the way, you combine these with the eight trigram postures, you have what's called the 13 postures. Uh, but what this really means is all techniques of Tai Chi Chuan, no matter what they are, can be done. Uh, and if, the, if they have to be done some other way, they're not a technique of Tai Chi Chuan. They can be done going forward, going backward, going left, going right, or standing in the center. This is despite the fact that certain techniques look like they're completely connected with motion. You know, if, uh, if you have a certain kind of, uh, you know, if you say, you know, you're going to attack someone, uh, you feel like, well, you're going forward to attack them. No, you can be going backward and attack them. A good example of this is uh, Muhammad Ali's knockout of George Foreman, in which he sort of bounced off the ropes and while going backwards knocked out George Foreman, which caused a lot of people to say, that's impossible, you can't do that. Of course you can do that. All you have to do is know how to turn your waist. So it doesn't matter which direction you're going. You can generate huge amounts of power whether you're standing still, whether you're going forward, backward, or right or left, or so forth. So anyway, that's kind of why they're the five element postures, because those are the five possible states of your movement. So that, again, is an ongoing process and, and very, very complex. Uh, and finally, or not finally, but almost finally, you get to the seventh element of my fundamentals, which is discharge. Now, uh, this is... Uh, a lot of Tai Chi schools and Tai Chi teachers would give you the impression that discharge is not your, uh, it's not an element of practice, it's a goal. When you become good at all these things, suddenly you become able to discharge people. And this is really, no, discharge is a practice which is simply a kind of final evolution of extremely lively legs, of extremely lively and careful and beautiful steps, when they become so energetic that you actually leave the ground, and that is simply a matter of how much energy is involved. It's not because you've decided to start jumping around. It's simply an evolution of this. This practice allows you to go to the point where you can exchange huge amounts of power, so much power that it would be dangerous if you didn't have these elements, if you weren't protected, in a sense, by your relationship with Taiji's with the opponent, and I could explain that some other time, and you are capable of manifesting this extreme energy of, you know, excess, you know, not violence exactly, but just excess enthusiasm in what you're doing as these discharge. Now, when we say the word discharge, what most people say is, no, no, that's that's not what discharge is. Discharge is when you see some guy being discharged and he like flies into the air like this and he lands over here. No, this is a, what I call a historical discharge, classical discharge, because this is what happens when someone who knows how to discharge confronts someone who is essentially double-weighted. And the technique of the Shaolin style and almost all of the styles of boxing in that region was to get power and strength by the deliberate practice of double weight. So that uh, it was completely, you know, a natural thing 
for Taiji people to encounter people who had this double-weighted stance. And this double-weighted stance is such that by simply trying to do it, you are helping the other person to discharge you. You're creating a condition in which you end up sort of jumping away from the other person. And in fact, uh, my teacher, Zhu Zhu Fang, uh, said that um, what discharge means is make him jump. This is a subject of kind of enlightenment on my part, because when I realized that, when I heard this, I said, oh, I think I understand something a lot better. You know, you are not taking this passive person and just slinging him away like you'd throw away a tiny baby or something. No, uh, this, nothing can do that. And that's why you can't discharge a drunk, you can't discharge your grandma. You know, if you give them that much force, you'll just kill them. Uh, and, you, you know, it's, it's something that a, the person either needs a certain amount of skill to do in terms of his footwork, so that this, like I say, is a manifestation of extremely lively footwork, which I call a proper discharge. Or it is uh, just a figment, a sort of uh, property that goes along with the martial art that they practice. You know, uh, my teacher used to say, uh, this makes them good targets for Tai Chi Chuan. So anyway, the practice of discharge, as I say, is a, is a high level practice, but it is just that, a practice. It is not a, it is not a power that you turn on people. Uh, now, when all of that is uh, sort of secured, uh, then you are free to practice the actual goal of Tai Chi Chuan, which relates to the original uh, name of Tai Chi Chuan. You might see this someplace. The original name of Tai Chi Chuan was called Long Boxing. Well, Long is a translation of a Chinese word, which is a character, and in Chinese it's very pictographic, and anything that's long, when it says long, it means it's like goes on for a long time, or is extended, or something, but, or continuous. So long boxing is better translated, perhaps, continuous boxing, you know, which some people might jokingly say, oh, endless fighting. <laughs> so in a certain sense, uh, yes, that is the goal of Tai Chi Chuan, endless fighting, in the sense that that's how you practice at the highest level with your fellow students. You practice going on and on rather than reaching conclusions. And this takes you to the ultimate kind of deepest goal of Tai Chi Chuan, which is change. Most martial arts talk about change, but they don't really offer you methods of learning how to do it. What all their methods are is how to keep from needing to change. When you apply a technique, if it doesn't work, that means it didn't stop everything. If you have to change, it means it didn't work. Uh, when I was teaching in Russia, one of the first objections I would get from students who would come, uh, especially from other martial arts, they would, when I would show them something, they would say, well, I wouldn't let you do that. And I would say, okay, go ahead and stop me. So they would stop me, assuming that what I was going to do was do it in such a powerful or fast or something way in which they wouldn't be able to stop me. But instead, I just changed to a different technique. Um, in which case, they would immediately stop and say, ah, you see, it didn't work. Uh, so if you can't sort of understand uh, the sophistication that this implies, then you, you really can't be tied to Chuan. Because ultimately, everything is about change. And so that's why, in a certain sense, uh, all the practice of Tai Chi Chuan sort of assumes that you, that you uh, are not succeeding in defeating and overpowering or overwhelming your opponent. And usually this is called loss. So it's called learning through loss or learning through losing, and that's why it has its thing. But when you really think about anything, you learn everything by losing, in the sense of by making mistakes and correcting them and making other mistakes and correcting them. And if you never lost, you would never learn. Everything you did would be right from the beginning. So actually, applying it to martial arts is no different from applying it to anything else. But with martial arts, it sounds a little odd. Why should I study a martial art that teaches me how to lose? Well, like I say, because if you know how to lose intelligently, it means you lose, but you change to something else. And that something else may be much stronger than what you lost. And this gives Tai Chi Chuan a certain philosophical flair. Because if you translate this into, you know, like the whole realm of your existence, 
then you see, oh, the many people mention this as the very wisest course of your life. That anything that causes you to lose in any way, if you can figure out some way to turn this into a new thing, into something else that can make you stronger, then it's actually been good for you. And you can look back to everything in life and say, oh, I'm glad it happened. As I say, this is a kind of you know, correspondence of a certain very physical thing that you do in Taiji to a certain philosophical thing that's quite deep. So, finally, you reach this goal of long boxing, which means, actually, when you think about it, finally you have reached kind of what the dream of all martial artists are, which is if you want to learn to fight, you should learn to fight by fighting. <laughs> and when you can do that, it means that you have a system so that you can practice all kinds of high-level things at a very high level of power and spontaneity, and yet you still do not have to worry about hurting each other. And this is the real gift of Tai Chi Chuan, which might otherwise be called another thing that martial artists dream of, which is sophisticated sparring without injury. And even better, going on for as long as you want it to go on to and follow until finally you stop because you want to have a break uh, and not because somebody has finally defeated someone else. And if you think that this kind of practice uh, is useless in real fighting uh, because when you're really fighting someone you won't really want to beat them, you'll just... Uh, no, that's only something that somebody could believe if they've never been in a fight. When you're in a fight, it's hard enough to control yourself to keep from overdoing things. So the, the most, uh, you know, it'll just make you over to, able to have much better control. And, and I'll leave you with one thing. Uh, one of the greatest, I think, wisdoms of the martial arts is the statement, <clears throat> it is easier to kill than to maim, easier to maim than to injure, easier to injure than to control, and easier to control than to enlighten. And when I say enlightenment, it's not the enlightenment of the Buddha. What it means by enlightenment is enlightening your opponent to the fact that you're better than he is. <laughs> that he, you know, what he, and this is the greatest experience in boxing. Not beating someone and putting them in a hospital, but having them suddenly stop and bow and say, wow, you are my teacher.